This novel was possible because of a Patreon member request. So if you want to support this channel you can consider becoming a Patreon member to make the request like this. Or you can support this channel on PayPal or Ko-fi link in the description. And if you want to buy Google Drive link which has more than 300 plus novel audiobook then you can visit my Ko-fi account. Where you will get Google Drive link in just $20 for lifetime. And if you want to support the author credit link will be in video discretion. Chapter 1, C1 Beginnings. Queens, New York, 2010. Beep beep beep. In a small, but homey, apartment in Queens, New York, a 15-year-old teenager sleeps like a brick in his small and dimly lit bedroom. He has dark brown hair and light Caucasian skin. If his eyes were opened anyone could see his brown eyes, which matched his hair. Beep beep beep. The alarm clock on the bedside table blares loudly, filling the room with its obnoxious tune. Knock knock. Peter. Knocking is heard as a female voice yells from outside the bedroom door. Peter, it's time for school. Unluckily, none of this woke the sleeping boy. Soon enough the door opened and in came a beautiful woman dressed in nurse scrubs. She looked to be in her mid to low thirties. Her hair, eyes, and skin tone were similar to the sleeping boy's. Possibly his mother or another relative. Peter, it's your first day of high school. She opens the curtains and sees Peter more clearly in the light. What the? As the morning light filled the room, she could see the sleeping teenager, laying in a puddle of his own sweat. He looked healthy and slept soundly, yet his sheets, blanket, and pillows were soaked in sweat. It was as if he slept in a sauna last night. Peter. She exclaims and dashes towards the bed, placing her hand on his head to check for a fever. Please tell me you didn't do any drugs. Not feeling a fever, she pulls the blanket off to check his body and sees something new, at least to her. Has he been exercising? She mutters. Peter, who took care of himself but didn't go to the gym or anything like that, now had slim yet defined muscles everywhere. He looked like he belonged in a CrossFit commercial. Peter. She shakes him, ready to get some answers or call 911 if he doesn't wake up. Ah, uh, huh. Peter mutters as he opens his eyes. Blinded by the morning sun coming through the window, he covers his eyes and sits up. Who's Peter? Where am I? What time is it? Peter Benjamin Parker? What drugs did you take? She exclaims. After hearing that he didn't know his own name, her imagination got the best of her as the worst possibilities played out in her mind. Huh? Did I take anything? The boy himself was wondering the same as he didn't know where he was, nor did he feel the usual aches in his leg like always. As his eyes got used to the light of the room, he looked up and saw a beautiful woman he had a sort of crush on. Insert picture of MCU Aunt May here. Aunt May. He mutters as he starts to think he may be high on something. What are you doing here? He was a big fan of Spider-Man and loved the MCU's version of Aunt May. She was the epitome of a MILF, and he respected that over the granny in the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies. I live here, Peter. May says as she looks at him like he was an idiot. Why yeah? Peter says as he looks around the room. Uh, can you give me a minute? No, it's your first day of high school today, but based on whatever this is dash May points to the sweat-soaked bed. Maybe it's best to call in sick and schedule a doctor's appointment. She asks with a contemplative look. Not sure what's going on, Peter decides to just play along until he can have some alone time to think. UMM, don't you have work? He asks, trying to find an excuse to be alone. Yes, I do but if you're sick I can call in and the hospital would understand, hopefully. She says with a skeptical look. No, go to work. They need you there more than me. I'll go to school. Peter says reassuringly. I just need a good shower and I'll be fine. I think I had food poisoning last night, but it's gone now. Oh no, do you think it was the Chinese we ordered? She asks worriedly. Probably not or you would have been sick as well. Peter says, surprised by his acting skills at this point. True, I wonder what you ate. If I didn't know you better, I'd say you overdosed on drugs or something. She says as she gives him one last look before heading towards the door. Get your butt in the shower and be quick about it. You have to leave in an hour and I have to go even sooner. Yes ma'am. Peter calls out as she leaves the room. And put your sheets in the wash. May calls out on her way to the kitchen. Ignoring her words, Peter, or the person that is now Peter quickly finds the bathroom and locks himself inside. Turning on the lights, he's shocked to see a Tom Holland lookalike staring back at him through the mirror. Insert picture of Tom Holland here. A slash N, P.S. He's six feet tall in this story. What the hell is going on? He muttered, not wanting to arouse suspicion from Aunt May. Waving to himself in the mirror and doing other weird movements to be sure this wasn't fake, the now named Peter Benjamin Parker was shocked beyond belief. Yesterday he was a poor orphan teenager with a dead right leg. His leg was crushed in a car accident that killed his parents, rendering his favored leg useless. Before today, he had to limp and hobble with a cane wherever he went. Not only that but the pain and aches that came along with his new disability were horrible. Though, now all of that is gone. No limping or pain anywhere. His leg, if you can even call it his is in better than perfect shape. In fact, his entire body is in perfect shape. After admiring his body and basking in the feeling of painlessness, John, or maybe it's Peter now, started wondering how this happened. Am I dreaming? He thought as he pinched himself as any other would do in this situation. Ouch. Okay, I'm not dreaming. After his body starts to calm down a bit, Peter noticed how thirsty he was. It felt like his mouth was made out of sandpaper or he slept in the middle of a hot desert with his mouth wide open. This is probably because of the sweat from earlier. 
he thought as he turned on the sink and started drinking from his hands. After a minute of drinking, a knock is heard at the door. Knock knock. I don't hear the shower running. Are you okay, Peter? Aunt May asks worriedly. Yeah, I'm fine. I was just brushing my teeth. Peter says as he opens the cabinet and grabs what he believes to be his toothbrush. Suddenly, as he takes the toothbrush, the nearby glass cup, presumably used for gargling, gets knocked over and falls out of the cabinet. Out of nowhere, Peter feels this odd tingling feeling and with one swift movement, he grabbed the cup before it could hit the sink and shatter. All right, but be quick all right. If you want to eat breakfast before leaving, then put some pep in your step. May says as she returns to the kitchen. Looking down at the cup in his hand, Peter came to a startling yet exciting conclusion. Am I Spider-Man? He mutters as he tries to set the cup down but can't. It's stuck to his hand somehow. Weird sense thing, sticky hands, Peter Parker, Aunt May, Tom Holland. Everything just made so much sense at that moment. He somehow became Peter Parker, but he doesn't know how. The last thing he could remember as John was. Oh, yeah. Peter mutters in a sad realization. In his past life, he remembers taking a bunch of his pain medication and falling asleep. I killed myself, huh? He thought as he sadly stared at himself in the mirror. Ever since he was in the accident and lost his use of his leg and his family, John, now named Peter, became depressed. He couldn't do anything without the pain of his leg reminding him of his dead parents, nor could he deal with the bullying his impairment brought him at school. Bullies love to pick on the odd one of the bunch and his bum leg certainly made him stand out. Not to mention the fact that his parents' savings were running low, and he couldn't hold a job and attend school with his leg problems. He could barely afford the medications. Sadly, he took his own life in the most painless form possible. Overdose on painkillers. It was easy as he didn't even need to search for his executioner. He already had that in a bottle and delivered to him whenever he ran out. Truthfully, he regretted it a few minutes after taking the handful of pills. His life wasn't all bad. He had hobbies and friends that were always there for him, but unluckily he was already getting drowsy by that point. He fell asleep trying to make himself throw up, but it was already too late. He died shortly after passing out. His heart stopped beating and the rest of his body followed suit. Though, I don't think I regret it anymore. Peter muttered as he stared at himself in the mirror. A slash N, give me some feedback in the comments. It's 1560 words. Don't forget my stones. Chapter 2, C2 First Day of School. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 5 chapters ahead at Chapter 7. I'll be writing 2 more chapters today. Get on. Though, I don't think I regret it anymore. Peter thought as he stared at himself in the mirror. Looking down at the cup attached to his hand, Peter tries to control his spider powers and once again sets the cup down in the sink. Still, he couldn't get the cup out of his hand, but after a few more tries it came loose and sat in the middle of the sink. Staring at his hands, Peter saw nothing wrong with them whatsoever. Though he couldn't say the same about his wrists. On the underside of each wrist right below the hand is a small hole. As he was inspecting the hole in his right wrist, a white substance shot out and covered Peter's eyes. A-H-H. He yelps and pulls the sticky web from his face, looking down at it in wonder. Luckily, Aunt May didn't hear him yell, so he didn't have to make something up again. Deciding that it may be best to just take a shower and worry about this later, Peter opens the shower curtain and turns the valve, shooting water from the shower head. But, as he twisted the valve, Peter put a bit too much power into it and the knob broke off like it was made of styrofoam or cardboard. Oops. After cleaning up and fixing the valve the best he could, Peter got dressed, ate his breakfast, and saw Aunt May off before taking the subway to the 36th Avenue station, which is right next to Midtown High. Walking up to the school, Peter takes in the sight of Midtown School of Science and Technology, also known as Midtown Technical High School. Seeing all the students hustle and bustle into the entrances, looking their best and ready for the first day of school, Peter couldn't help but feel excited. He never liked high school in his past life. Even before his parents died and the bullying started, school life was never a fun or exciting thing for him, yet this time around Peter is ready to seize the day and enjoy himself to the fullest. Peter decided on the train that he wouldn't waste this second chance. No other person that commits suicide gets these kinds of perks, at least he doesn't think they do, so Peter would live his new life however he pleases and make the best of every situation. Walking inside, Peter went straight to the main office and asked for his schedule. He couldn't find it before he left but knew it wasn't a big deal. The staff in the office only had to look up his name and print his schedule. It took less than a minute. They also gave Peter his locker number and combination. Thankfully, the old Peter was a prepared person and already packed a backpack for him to take, which he appreciated. After a quick trip to his locker to drop off some books, Peter heads down the hall looking for his first class of the day. On his way down the hall, a slick-haired teenager with an evil grin pops out from behind a locker and tries to purposefully bump into Peter, who was looking at his schedule. Flash Thompson. Insert picture of MCU Flash here. What's up Penis Parker? The slick-haired teen greets loudly just as he was about to bump into Peter, drawing everyone's attention. Peter didn't need his spy day senses to know what was going on, but instead of stepping away, Peter puts a bit more power into his next step. Bang. Erga. Flash gets sent tumbling backward and grunts in pain as he hits the floor. Oh, hey Flash. Peter looks up from his schedule for a moment before swiftly walking past the fallen bully, acting like nothing happened. What the f asterisk ck just happened? 
Flash muttered as he grabs his shoulder in pain. Everyone who saw it, thanks to Flash's loud greeting, was rather amused. Most of the first years knew Flash and Peter, who has always been Flash's punching bag, so seeing the little guy win for once was certainly surprising and refreshing. They just wondered if it would last and what Flash would do to get back at him later on. To these teenagers, this is the peak entertainment. Of course, Peter didn't plan on being a punching bag anymore. He didn't care for being popular, partying, or anything like that. The one thing that he'll put his foot down on is being bullied. Especially by such a sh asterisk tty version of Flash Thompson. Back to Peter, he found his class and took a seat near the window. No one else has arrived yet so he simply waits patiently for class to start. Up until now, everything has led Peter to believe that he's in the MCU. His apartment, Aunt May, his appearance, Flash's appearance, and even the school is an exact replica. He has a few options laid out before him. Of course, Peter planned to collect the Infinity Stones or destroy them as a last resort. They are far too dangerous to be left to whoever gets their hands on them. He also should give the Ancient One a visit. She would make a good ally and maybe he could learn some of the mystic arts if he's able to. So far that's all the plans Peter has set in stone. Everything else is up for debate. Maybe he'll contact S.H.I.E.L.D. and learn some martial arts from them, but he's sure that would come with a price, so it may not be the smartest idea. Though, he could use that connection to find information about the Tesseract. As Peter is thinking of future plans while looking out the window, in walks a chubby Filipino teenager. He scans the room and immediately beelines straight to Peter's desk. Dude, is it true? He sits in front of Peter and turns to look at him questioningly. What? Peter asks on reflex as he turns to see his new classmate. Ned Leeds, Peter Parker's best friend. Insert picture of MCU Ned here. What do you mean what? Ned starts acting as if something epic happened. Is it true you got one over on Flash? Everyone is talking about it. Huh? Yeah, I guess. Peter says with a shrug. He tried to bump into me so I bumped into him harder. Hearing these words out of his best friend's mouth, Ned's eyes go wide as his mouth hangs open. Close your mouth. Bugs will fly in. Peter says jokingly. Dude, Flash has been tormenting us since middle school started. I'm just amazed that we finally got one over him. Ned acts like Peter climbed the highest mountain and carried him the whole way. Relax, Ned. Peter tries to calm him down. We only bumped into each other and he's most likely going to do something about it. You're right. Ned finally understood the problem they have. Though it's not really a problem for Peter, he won't say that. Peter actually felt pretty comfortable with Ned. He reminds him of the few close friends he had in his past life. Before they could speak more about it, the class began to fill rapidly and the teacher arrived as well. Unsurprisingly, Ned, Flash, Liz Allen, and Michelle Jones are all in Peter's homeroom class. Elizabeth Liz Allen, Nay Toomes, is the daughter of Adrian Toomes and Doris Toomes. Her father is the future alien weapons trafficker, Vulture. Insert picture of MCU Liz here. Though, Peter doesn't have to worry about that until after the Chitori invasion concludes. Liz was also Peter's crush in the first Spider-Man movie, but based on the look Ned gave him when she walked in, she was his crush here too. Well, not anymore. He's sure she's a nice girl but Peter has his sights set on another target so to speak. Speaking of, Peter turns his head to see Michelle Joan, otherwise known as MJ. She looks exactly like the actress that plays her in the movies, Zendaya. Insert picture of MJ slash Zendaya here. Just like the granny version of Aunt May, Peter didn't like the MJ in the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, but this one is a million times better. Which is why he planned to ask her out on a date. Though not today. Peter has so much to do today. The second school ends, he plans to go to a secluded area and test out his new powers. Though he would have to be careful with surveillance cameras. That's how Tony Stark found his identity in the movies. Of course, that's not the only reason he's stalling to ask MJ out on a date. In both lives, Peter has never had a girlfriend, let alone been on a date before. He was always too nervous and when he started getting the courage to do it in his past life, the accident happened and ruined everything. Also, Peter is currently broke and needs money for the date, which should be easily acquired with his newfound powers. He could simply ask Aunt May for cash but they don't seem like the wealthiest family. That's another plan to add to the top of the list. Find a way to steal some money unnoticed. Maybe pickpocket people in Manhattan? That would be the simplest and fastest way to get money. Or he could sneak into a bank and steal a few bands. Though that would be a bit too risky compared to pickpocketing. He only needs pocket money anyway. At least for now. A slash n, 1590 words. How's it going? Good? Don't forget my stones. Chapter 3, C3 Testing Powers. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 4 chapters ahead at Chapter 7. I'll be writing 2 more chapters today. Get on. As Peter went from class to class, he was met by the constant glare of Flash, who was thinking of any way possible to get back at him. Flash, at least in the MCU, didn't seem to physically bully Peter, he focused more on making fun of him with different types of verbal and psychological attacks. Though sometimes he'll get physical in minor ways like what happened this morning. While Peter was eating lunch with Ned, he saw Flash eating at the popular kid's table and laughing while pointing at him every once in a while, most likely making fun of Peter. If he wasn't a victim of far more drastic and physical bullying in his past life, Peter would probably be negatively affected by this, but compared to that, this type of bullying was nothing. 
Though that doesn't mean he would let it go unpunished, Peter would have to do that in a more sneaky fashion. He doesn't want to be expelled from school for beating Flash Black and Blue. He can do similar things to what happened this morning, or some pranks that don't implicate him. Peter will have to plan something out to humiliate Flash another day. Maybe after that he would learn some humility. Speaking of doing similar things like this morning, as Peter was putting away his lunch tray, Flash stuck his leg out and tried to trip him as he walked by. Easily catching this with his enhanced senses, Peter pretended to be oblivious and stomped on Flash's foot as he passed by. Arg. Flash grunted in pain and pulled his foot back instantly. Peter acted as if he didn't see a thing and kept walking, putting his tray away and returning to Ned, who watched the whole thing with a face full of awe and wonder. Dude, that was so cool. Ned said excitedly in a hushed voice as he stole glances at Flash, who is nursing his aching foot. What happened to you, Peter? Nothing much. Peter says with a shrug. I just decided that I wouldn't let Flash push me around this year. I want to enjoy my time without having to look over my shoulder or worry about what others say about me. Hearing Peter's little speech, Ned nodded along with him and became excited by every word. Yeah, I won't let him bully me either. Ned says in determination. Good for you Ned. Peter pats him on the shoulder. Don't worry, I got your back. As the school day came to an end, Ned wanted to hang out after school, but Peter gave him a random excuse and dipped. Using his phone, Peter looks for abandoned buildings and tries his best to find the perfect training location. It took about an hour to find the best place, as Peter had to quadruple check that there were no cameras in the area. He doesn't mind Tony Stark knowing his true identity, but Peter would rather shield and by extension Hydra stay in the dark. Maybe someday he would grandly announce his identity like Tony Stark, but that would have to wait until he had more, money, resources, and the power to protect himself and those around him. Due to the cameras everywhere in New York, Peter had to use the basement of an abandoned warehouse. Thankfully, it was spacious and wasn't falling apart, like many of the other abandoned buildings he saw before this. As soon as he was done scouting out the area, Peter sent a text to Aunt May, explaining that he would be home late, and started testing out his powers. Spider-Man is said to have multiple powers. Superhuman strength. Superhuman speed. Superhuman reflexes. Superhuman durability. Healing factor. Dash spider sense alert. Hidden senses. Wall crawling. Web shooters, organic. Starting with superhuman strength, Peter found many large heavy metal I-beams, which were usually used in construction, and tried lifting them. He lifted one and was surprised by how light it felt. It was as though the beam was one of those styrofoam movie props, disguised as the real thing. After a quick Google search, Peter found that an I-beam of this size weighs 520 pounds, so one-fourth of a ton. Seeing as the first I-beam was easy, Peter made himself a makeshift extreme bench press with web and some I-beams. Webbing two I-beams together, Peter lay underneath and tried lifting them as if he were at the gym. Once again he found it pretty easy to lift, so Peter kept adding weight until he began to struggle. After many add-ons, Peter found that he could lift 40 I-beams at once, which totaled a little over 10 tons. Anything over that would cause Peter to strain a muscle and hurt himself. He could be able to up that 10-ton limit by doing some extreme weight lifting, but that would have to wait until he tested his other powers. Next, Peter moved on to testing his superhuman speed, running circles around the warehouse basement. Before starting he found an app that shows how fast you run, but sadly that app couldn't register his speed. Most likely thinking he's in a car or something. Thankfully, there were a few apps that tell you how fast you bike, which had a much higher threshold and was able to track his speed, which was higher than he thought possible at around 100 miles per hour, which is a little over four times faster than Usain Bolt. Reflexes, heightened senses, and spider senses were harder to test but still possible. Peter took softball-sized rocks and hung them on webs from the ceiling, pushing each rock, causing them to swing erratically and create an odd death trap of swinging rocks in the center of the warehouse basement. After his booby trap was finished, Peter stepped in with his eyes closed and trusted his senses. The tingling feeling returned and Peter trusted it, dodging up, down, right, left, forward, and back. His enhanced senses and reflexes combined with his spider sense made him look like a skilled dancer as he smoothly weaved in and around the death trap. Next, Peter stood completely still in the center of the swinging rocks, allowing them to crash into different parts of his body. This is testing his superhuman durability and healing factor, which was something he dreaded but sadly it had to be done. After being hit by a few dozen ham-fist-sized rocks, they lost their momentum and hung limply from the ceiling. Stepping out of the hanging rocks section of the warehouse, Peter saw that he barely had a mark on his body, and any mark he had already started fading away. Though he couldn't say the same about his clothes, which were now ripped in certain areas. Damn, what should I tell Aunt May? Peter muttered as he thought it would have been smarter to take off his clothes beforehand. Maybe I'll pickpocket some rich guy on the way home and buy some new clothes. He could sneak in through his bedroom window and change clothes, but who knows how many cameras are outside his apartment building. Speaking of cameras, Peter would have to find a way to deal with that problem. Living in the modern world is hard as an up-and-coming superhero. Tony Stark used Jarvis to find his identity far too easily in the movies, so maybe he needs some type of technology that scrambles a camera's picture when he's within a certain distance. Maybe a magical item that renders him invisible to a camera could work too? For either of those options to work, Peter would need some extra help.
For the technological route, he could probably make it himself, as he was fairly smart even in his past life. That combined with his new genius Parker brain should make him capable enough to make it. Sadly, the parts he would need may be unavailable to the general public or simply hard to obtain. Peter would have to get some help, and Tony Stark would probably be that person. Making it with Tony Stark's help would also speed up his work time and enhance the end product by a lot. Not to mention the fact that Peter needs a Spider-Man suit, which could be made a lot quicker with Tony's help. Though Peter's unsure if he should meet Tony this early on, it may be better to wait until he returns from captivity as a more responsible man. The magical route would be impossible as he has no idea how that would even work, which means he would have to ask the Ancient One for help. He already planned to visit her anyway, so this may be the best bet. Finally, moving on to the last two powers on the list, Peter shot webs from his wrists and started crawling and walking on the walls and ceiling. He didn't have room to test web swinging, but that can be done outside when the camera scrambler is acquired. With every one of his powers tested, Peter checked his phone and saw 10 texts and 2 missed calls from his Aunt May, mostly concerning when he would be home and why he isn't answering her. Checking the time, Peter saw that it was almost 10 p.m., which isn't that bad but the old Peter probably didn't stay out very late. Sigh, I don't think I have time to buy new clothes. A slash n, 1585 words. Don't forget my stones. Chapter 4, C4 Ancient 1. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 3 chapters ahead at Chapter 7. I'll be writing 2 more chapters today. Get on. On his way home, Peter managed to pickpocket a few men in nice suits. He didn't want to rob poor people as they have no money and he would feel bad, so he kept his targets to the wealthier looking men. Women usually kept their money in purses, which would be harder and more noticeable when stolen, so he stayed away from them as well. Thanks to his enhanced senses and reflexes, Peter didn't bother taking their wallets and simply emptied them before placing them back in his rich victim's pockets. He would brush shoulders with someone, snatch their wallet, pocket the cash, and slip the wallet back to them. When he arrived back at his apartment, Aunt May was in the living room watching Korean dramas with her phone nearby. As soon as she saw him walk in, she muted the TV and looked at him expectantly. Okay, what's going on? She asks from her seat on the couch. What do you mean? Peter asks, hoping to avoid whatever is going on. You have this weird sickness this morning, then you stay out longer than you ever have before? Not to mention the rips in your shirt and jeans. Something is up. Now spill. Aunt May looks him up and down. I, uh. Making a split second decision, Peter comes up with a good excuse. I got an off the books job to pay for a date, but I haven't asked the girl out yet. May looks into Peter's eyes, searching for any deception. That's it. Yeah, this morning was just food poisoning though. Peter adds with a shrug. What about your clothes? She says gesturing to Peter's ripped outfit. I was working on a construction site. Peter explains easily. Huh, so that's why you're more muscular now. May mutters as she stands and walks up to Peter before wrapping him in her arms. Please don't hide things from me. I thought you were in trouble or doing drugs. If you needed money, you could always ask me. You don't have to get a dangerous construction job. I'm sorry, May. Peter said as he hugged her back. Don't worry, today was my last day of work. I've saved up enough money to last a while. He felt bad for Aunt May. She technically lost her nephew, or son since she raised him, and now someone else has taken his place. At this moment, Peter swore to himself that he would take care of May as thanks to the old Peter. As they separated, Aunt May looked at him with an inquisitive smirk. So, who's the lucky girl? She asks like a paparazzi ready to get her scoop. I'll bring her over sooner or later. You'll find out then. Peter says as he heads toward the bathroom. What? You can't just drop something like this on me and walk away. I need to know. May follows him with a pout on her face. Well, you'll just have to be patient. Peter says with a smirk as he closes the bathroom door in her face. Dash one week later. After a full week of school and training in the warehouse basement, Peter was finally ready to meet the Ancient One. If he wanted to safely become Spider-Man without worrying about risking his everyday life and the safety of people like May, Ned, and eventually MJ, then Peter would need her help. During this past week, Peter found out that he could enhance his already ridiculous powers with exercise. Though because of his already crazy level of strength, that exercise is something that would flatten the best bodybuilder in seconds. He also has his powers completely under control at this point. It took a little training, but he doesn't break things on accident or hear slash smell things at a crazy level anymore. Though he can if he tries. The underground warehouse has been renovated into a makeshift gym. Peter already had the extreme bench press, so he just needed to add on with other equipment made from random junk and held together by his webbing, which he found is extremely durable. There is so much web in that basement that it actually looks like a spider's lair, ready to trap any prey that wanders in. Other than that, Peter has used his stolen money to update his wardrobe a bit. He didn't mind the old Peter's style, but he wanted to bring a bit of his old self into this new life of his, which pretty much consisted of hoodies, joggers, jeans, white shirts, and a pair of white Nike Air Maxes. Ned was surprised by his change in clothes, while May gave a few good comments about how he looked recently. The only problem Peter has had this week, if you can even call him that, was Flash who kept trying to mess with him and failed horribly. On Wednesday, he tried to pick on Ned, since he couldn't do anything to Peter, but Ned wasn't having it. 
He followed in Peter's footsteps and ignored Flash completely, and since Ned is almost always with Peter at school, any minor physical bullying was thwarted by Peter at every turn. Sadly, Peter has been too busy to put together a prank on Flash, but it would come soon enough. After school was out on Friday, Peter said goodbye to Ned and took the subway to the New York Sanctum. The Sanctum Sanctorum is located on 177A Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village, New York City. Standing outside the big double doors, Peter nervously knocked. He would be meeting the strongest person on Earth, the Sorcerer Supreme, otherwise known as the Ancient One. As the door creaked open, a Caucasian man in monk robes peeks his head out. Can I help you? He asks in a New York-style accent. Ah, I'm here to meet with the Ancient One. Do I need to schedule an appointment or? Peter asks nervously. Huh, the man says as he looks at Peter weirdly. Please come inside. I'll contact the Ancient One for you. As the man opens the door, Peter walks in and admired the architecture of the big open entrance hall. Thank you. Should I just wait here? Peter asks as the monk rushes off, leaving him standing there. All right, I'll just stay here. Feeling curious as he waits, Peter walked around the entrance area, looking for anything interesting or possibly magical. Sadly, they don't seem to leave anything like that just laying around, which makes sense. After waiting a few minutes, the monk came running back out of breath. T the Ancient One will see you now. He pants for breath as he motions for Peter to follow him. Taking a stance and making a circular motion with his hand, a golden spark appears in the air and forms a large circle. In the center of the circle appears an entirely different location. Wow, is that a portal? Peter exclaims as he walks up to it and puts his hand in and out. He has seen this in the movies but it's a different experience in real life. I hope I'm able to learn the mystic arts. Follow me? The monk says as he steps into the portal. Following him through, Peter teleported all the way across the world to Kathmandu, Nepal in Kamar Taj. He didn't know that for sure but the room he appeared in looked very similar to the one Doctor Strange first met the Ancient One in all her baldness. There were tables set up around the room and a couple masters dressed in robes sat and drank tea. The Ancient One was nowhere to be found, so Peter turned around to ask the monk that guided him, but he was already gone. UMM, hello. Peter turns back to one of the serious looking monks. Is the Ancient One on her way? Sadly, he doesn't get an answer, so Peter concluded that they may not speak English. After waiting an awkward couple of minutes, someone else finally arrived. Thank you for keeping my guest company Master Simone and Chow. You may return to your duties. The Ancient One rounds a corner and enters the room. Insert picture of her grand baldness here. Yes, ma'am. No problem, Master Ancient One. Both of the masters say as they bow and leave the room. They spoke English that entire time. Peter asks rhetorically with a confused look. Turning to the Ancient One, Peter gives her a small bow. Hello, do you play jokes like this on all of your visitors? Yes, especially the interesting ones. She says as she takes a seat at a table and grabs a waiting tea kettle. Would you like some tea? Ah, uh, sure thanks. As Peter sits across from the Ancient One, she waves her hand, conjuring a tea set for them to use. Cool. A slash N, 1485 words. Don't forget my stones. Chapter 5, C5 Advantageous Deal. As of this chapter, the Patreon is two chapters ahead at Chapter 7. I'll be writing two more chapters today. Get on. Mr. Parker, it seems we have much to speak about. The Ancient One says as she pours Peter and herself a cup of tea. You can call me Peter. He says as he puts two cubes of sugar and a splash of milk in his cup. Peter it is. She nodded and took a sip of her tea. Could you tell me why you're here? Does she not know? Peter thought as he took a sip of his tea as well. The Ancient One was known to look into the many possible futures using the time stone, yet based on her question, she didn't see Peter's arrival coming. This is good for him as Peter would rather she didn't know about him taking over Peter's body. She may overreact and think of him as a threat to the earth or something, and a pissed off Ancient One isn't something he is capable of dealing with. I came to ask for your help. Peter says plainly as he sips his tea. How can I help you, Peter? The Ancient One asks. I was recently bitten by an odd spider and got some weird powers. Peter says as he shoots a web up above him, pulling himself up to the ceiling and crawling around a bit before returning to his seat. Okay, how can I help you with this? She asks with a raised brow. The Ancient One didn't know everything about the world or the universe, but she knew all the major possibilities that could happen in her lifetime and slightly after, yet she had no knowledge of this situation. The feeling of not knowing was uncomfortable yet refreshing for someone like her who hasn't been surprised in a very long time. This whole situation truly threw her for a loop. I plan to use my powers to help people, but I've noticed how many cameras are in New York. If I dress up in a disguise and run around the city as a sort of vigilante, it would only be a matter of time before a security camera caught me either unmasked or returning home. Peter explains. I see, and you think I can help with this? The Ancient One says as she crosses her legs. Well, you are the strongest person on Earth. It was either you or Tony Stark and he doesn't seem very reliable. Peter says with a shrug. Okay, I can help with this, but I want you to tell me how you knew to come here. You could say that I'm a very informed person, yet I didn't expect your arrival. The Ancient One agreed but gave Peter a stipulation. I'm sorry but I can't tell you that. If I were to give an answer, it would be a lie and I wouldn't be surprised if you could somehow tell if I lie. Peter refuses respectfully. Hmm, it seems we've arrived at an impasse. 
The ancient one smiles as she sips her tea. She is enjoying this. There has to be something else I can do for you in exchange. Peter asks as he places his empty teacup down. Hmm, perhaps. The ancient one says as she stands from her seat. Follow along. As they leave the room, the ancient one leads Peter to a crowded courtyard. Many people dressed in monk robes seemed to be trying and failing to open a portal, like the one he came through earlier. Ah, uh, do you want me to help with their practice or something? Maybe bring them towels and water? Peter asks questioningly. No, Peter. The ancient one smirked and handed him a bronze sling ring. You are going to join them. UMM, I don't get it. Peter says as he takes the offered a long ring on reflex. How is this an even exchange? It seems like I get to learn magic and your help. It's a win-win for me but not so much for you, isn't it? Oh, on the contrary. I get a capable master who's connected to the web of life and destiny. You would make a formidable master of the mystic arts. What comes with this opportunity is a responsibility to protect the earth and its inhabitants from otherworldly magical forces and powerful dimensional entities. Are you prepared to take that responsibility? The Ancient One asks as their conversation turns deadly serious. What the hell is the web of life and destiny? Is that a Spider-Man thing I don't know about? Peter thought as he looked at the Ancient One questioningly. What's the web of life and destiny? I'm afraid you'll have to learn that in your studies. That is if you accept my offer of course. She says with a small smirk. Peter didn't know much about Marvel, as he mostly watched the movies, but he could tell that this web thing has to be related to Spider-Man in some way, which means it's connected to him. Fine, I'm willing to help when I'm needed, but if other masters can deal with the problem I'd rather not be bothered. Peter agrees with a small stipulation. Hmm, that sounds agreeable. The Ancient One says and holds out her hand. Do we have an accord? Peter was about to shake her hand, but he pulled back last minute as a moment of greed took over. Hmm, can I sneak in a magically enchanted spider-style suit for my hero gig? Nothing crazy. Maybe make it extremely durable so I don't have to fix or replace it. You can add the anti-camera thing to it as well. Peter says as he hesitates to shake her outstretched hand. Sure, I would be honored to make Spider-Man's first superhero suit. She agrees easily and Peter immediately takes her hand. Spider-Man. I like that. Peter pretends not to know his own future. Having the Ancient One create the suit would save Peter days of sewing and stitching it together himself. The best part about this is the fact that she's seen the future and already knows what it's supposed to look like. Not to mention the cool enchantments that she would add to it. Peter couldn't wait to see what she does. After coming to an agreement, Peter joined his fellow students in sling ring practice without much direction from the Ancient One. In fact, she left him there to learn on his own. Copying the stance and motions of those around him and picturing the top of Mount Everest, Peter slips his new sling ring on and tries his best. On his first try, a golden spark appeared and drew half a circle before fizzling out and disappearing. He may have failed, but the feeling of using magic for the first time was euphoric. Peter was worried that he wouldn't be capable of learning the mystic arts or that the Ancient One wouldn't allow it, but here he is about to open a magical portal. Huh, this may be easier than I thought. After an hour of practice, Peter was so close to drawing a full circle with the golden energy. Taking a quick break, Peter asked a few of his fellow students some questions and learned that the golden energy is called Eldritch Energy, which is a type of dimensional energy. So, he's currently practicing Eldritch Magic. Eldritch Magic, which is utilized by the masters of the mystic arts, is a light-based magic that produces sparks and fiery energy in a yellow-slash-orange color palette. This energy is capable of giving off not only light, but also warmth. Being highly versatile, it can be used to generate constructs of tangible energy, such as melee weapons and shields, as well as to cast spells by conjuring specific formations and geometric patterns with the fiery energy. The practice of opening a portal with the help of a sling ring is technically the easiest thing that can be done with eldritch energy, which Peter found odd as they were technically bypassing space and maybe even time with what they were doing. After getting this explanation from his fellow students, Peter got back to work. On his next try, he put all of the knowledge and feelings he had into one last go of it. He had to get home soon or Aunt May would start to worry. Not to mention the fact that he doesn't have cell service here, so he's currently unable to contact her. With his mind set on his destination, Peter took the stance and slowly waved his hand in a circle. Golden Eldritch energy sparked to life and steadily formed a full circle in front of him. As the two ends of the circle connected, the center warped into the image of a snowy mountain peak. Ha 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 ha. Laughing like a madman, Peter jumped through the portal and admired the view. I did it. A slash n, 1486 words. Don't forget my stones. Chapter 6, C6 Spider Suit. As of this chapter, the Patreon is three chapters ahead at chapter 9. I'll be writing two more chapters today. Get on. A slash N, I forgot to mention the update schedule. One chapter will be uploaded every day at 12 p.m. est. Edit, can any late readers let me know if this story updated in your library? Like did it show a new chapter was out? Mine didn't and I want to know if it's a me problem or a web novel problem. As Peter was basking in his success on a cold mountain peak, he heard someone clear their throat behind him. Ahem. Turning around, Peter sees the Ancient One smiling at him from the other side of the portal. Congratulations, Peter. Though we should close the portal, your fellow students are a bit more susceptible to the cold than you are. 
Hearing her say this, Peter looked behind the Sorcerer Supreme and sees everyone keeping their distance from the portal and rubbing their hands together for warmth. Each of them was shaking slightly from the freezing air that made its way through the portal he opened. Oh, sorry. Peter says as he leaps back through the portal and tries to close it, but no matter what he did it wouldn't close. UMM, how do I close it? Sighing in exasperation, the Ancient One moves her hands in a circular motion. A spell circle draws itself in front of her and all sorts of runes appear on it. Once it was finished, the spell circle morphed into a dome that encased her, Peter, and his portal inside. Instantly, the area outside the dome warmed up and the students sighed in relief before returning back to their practice. All right, now that they aren't freezing to death, you can close the portal. The Ancient One says as she motions toward the portal. Ah, uh, can I get a hint? Peter asked, but the Ancient One merely sat on the floor and began to meditate, ignoring him completely. I guess the cold doesn't bother her. After a good ten minutes, Peter was able to successfully close the portal. It was actually far easier than he thought. His problem was simply overthinking. Peter thought that he had to move his hand and slowly close it, but all he had to do was think of it disappearing and it would. Well, that took you long enough. The Ancient One says as she stands from her meditative pose, dispelling the dome that protected the other students. Yeah, though it would have been faster if you told me how to do it. Peter says as he sees the ice and snow that filled the area. Luckily, he was very resistant to the cold, which is something he didn't know about his spider powers. Though that doesn't mean he doesn't feel the cold a little. The Ancient One must have something that's protecting her as well because she looked even less affected than he was. Magic, in a way, is an advanced science, but it's also a feeling. You will learn faster if you trust that feeling. In a lot of your future training, I won't explain everything and let you learn on your own. The Ancient One explains. Oh, I guess that makes sense. Peter shrugged as he was new to this whole magic thing. Good, now that you've learned to use the sling ring, we can move on to the next step of your training. She says, but Peter raises his hand as if he was in school. What? I need to get home soon. My Aunt May will be back from work soon. Peter explained his time constraints. Sigh, this is why we don't take in students under 18 years of age. The Ancient One mutters under her breath, but Peter could hear her thanks to his super senses. The time constraints always make teaching them a hassle. Time constraints? You have the literal time infinity stone. Time should be the least of your problems. Peter thought as he scratched the back of his neck. Yeah, I have school and my aunt isn't used to me staying out too late. She's been getting better with it but it's a slow process. No, don't worry about it. I say that, but it's not that much of a problem. We'll just have to come up with a schedule for you. She says, motioning for Peter to follow her. Returning to the room where he met the Ancient One, Peter saw what he believes to be his Spider-Man suit. It was laid out on one of the wooden tables and looked better than he imagined it would. It was similar to the original Spider-Man suit in that it is red and blue with some webbing design on some of the red sections. Though it was different from what he thought she would make. You made it already. Peter asked excitedly as he dashes to the table at breakneck speed. With the enchantments too. It didn't have any markings that would lead him to believe it was enchanted. No runes, spell circles, or anything like that. Yes, something like this is easy. It took me five minutes to make. The Ancient One brags a bit as she enjoys Peter's reaction to her work. Wow, you're amazing. I knew it was better to come here rather than Stark. Peter praises her work as he reaches out to touch the suit. As soon as his hand touched the suit, gold spell circles along with runes covered every inch of the suit. After a moment, the suit was sucked up into Peter's hand and disappeared. Ah, what just happened? Peter says as he looks back and forth between the now empty table and his empty hand. The suit is bound to you now. Simply think of it and the suit will appear. The Ancient One explains. All right, here it goes. Peter mutters as he thinks of the suit. Suddenly, the clothes he's wearing are instantly replaced by his brand new superhero suit, which surprisingly has a hood. Though, Peter didn't mind one bit. Seeing Peter looking down at his hands and legs, the Ancient One waves her hand, and a body-sized mirror appeared in front of him. That's so cool. Peter says in awe and wonder. Insert picture of this story's cover here. I'm glad you like my work dash the Ancient One says as she stands beside him, looking at his suit in the mirror. But that's not all it does. The suit is made to be resistant to most things, like water, fire, tearing, cutting, etc. It's also enchanted to increase that resistance by a bit. Though don't get too cocky. Enough damage would be able to break through the suit, but it will regenerate back to new a few hours after the damaged happens. It's made to last, not as a sort of protective armor. Do you understand? Yay, yeah, don't overly rely on the suit to protect me. I get it. Peter nods his head as he puts up his hood. Damn, the hood was a nice touch. Yes, I thought you'd like it. The Ancient One smiles as she watches him make random poses in the mirror. Now onto what you originally asked for. Suddenly, the Ancient One takes a smartphone out of her robe, which surprises Peter to no extent. You have a smartphone. He asks with the shock clear in his voice. Yeah, did you think I would be some old-fashioned monk that knows nothing of the modern age? She asks in a challenging tone. I mean, truthfully, yeah. Can I have your phone number? Peter asks and the Ancient One shakes her head as she takes a picture of Peter with her phone. Look at this. She turns the phone to Peter, showing him a picture of the room without him in it at all. The suit is invisible to all cameras, but you can turn that off and on at will. Think of turning it off. Peter does as she says and feels a slight vibration run through the suit. 
As the vibration disappears, the Ancient One takes another picture and shows it to him. This time he was completely visible. If you look in the bottom right corner of your right eye, you will see a small camera icon with an on and off icon next to it. The off part of it should be highlighted right now. That's to prevent any confusion. She explains and Peter sees exactly what she said. Wow, you really thought of everything. Peter praises her as he turns it back on and sees the icon highlight the on part now. When I make a deal, I intend to fulfill it to the utmost extent. The last thing to test is taking the suit off. Just think of the suit disappearing and it will. She explains and Peter does as she says. Instantly, the Spider-Man suit is replaced by the clothes he was wearing earlier. The suit was nowhere to be seen. You've certainly outdone yourself. Peter says as he turns to the Ancient One and bows to her. Thank you. He knew that she was as old as dirt and bowing seemed like the best way to show his thanks. The other monks did it earlier when he met her, so he's just following their lead. You're very welcome, Peter. She says with a smile as she checks the time. I'm afraid I have duties to return to, so why don't you head home and return tomorrow morning? It's the weekend so you shouldn't have school, right? Yeah, sounds good. Peter instantly agrees as the Ancient One turns to leave. W wait, how do I leave here? Without saying a word, the Ancient One holds up her hand, showing Peter her sling ring as she turns the corner leaving Peter alone in the room. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Peter mutters as he looks down at his new sling ring. A slash N, 1600 word. Don't forget my stones. Or I'll kill Aunt May just like she died in the newest Spider-Man movie. Ha 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 ha. Chapter 7, C7 Debut. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 4 chapters ahead at chapter 11. I'll be writing 2 more chapters today. Get on. I slash N, I accidentally deleted a lot of the paragraph comments in the last chapter when I edited it. Oops lol. Won't be doing that again. Checking the time on his phone, Peter saw that it was 4.47pm which means Aunt May is still working at the hospital. Knowing he won't get caught, Peter used his new sling ring and opened a portal to his bedroom. Stepping inside, Peter drops his school bag as the portal closes behind him. Knowing Aunt May wouldn't be home yet, Peter went to the kitchen and started cooking dinner. He would be sneaking out for his first night as Spider-Man tonight, so he decided to spend some time with May before heading out. After making some chicken parmesan, Aunt May arrived home and kicked off her shoes with a tired look. Ugh, I can't wait to do nothing for the whole night. She exclaims as she slams the door behind her. Sniff sniff Peter, are you cooking? Rushing to the kitchen, May saw Peter plating the chicken with a big bowl full of salad next to him. Ugh, what's going on Peter? She asks, eyeing the food suspiciously. I got home a bit earlier than you so I thought I should cook. Peter shrugged as he put the filled plates on the dining table. Peter doesn't know this, but the old Peter has tried to cook for May a few times in the past. During the first incident, he started a small grease fire that could have burned the apartment down if she wasn't there to put it out. On the last try, he went through many kitchen safety videos on YouTube but ended up giving himself and his aunt May food poisoning. It's safe to say that seeing Peter cooking in the kitchen is a bit traumatizing for May. She didn't trust the food and she certainly doesn't trust that he won't burn the place down. Speaking of, after getting over her shock, May walked over to check the oven, stovetop, toaster, microwave, and even the coffee machine to make sure that Peter didn't leave anything running. May, come eat. Peter said as he grabbed the salad and some utensils before heading back to the table. UMM, Peter. May says nervously as she takes a seat in front of her plate. Peter was sitting across from her, ready to dig in. Are you sure you should be cooking? She was trying to be nice, but she wasn't ready for another bout of food poisoning. She had to take a few days off work the last time, which wouldn't have been bad if she wasn't in the bathroom for most of that time. What's going on? Is there something I don't know? Peter thought as he finally noticed May's odd behavior. He really hated that he didn't get the old Peter's memories. Peter has had a few moments like this, where the people around him know something that he doesn't. Luckily, he's been able to get past those situations without arousing any suspicion. UMM, why? Peter asked. Let's not play dumb, Peter. Your track record in the kitchen isn't very stellar, to say the least. May says as she looks down at her food cautiously. Oh, I get it now. The old Peter was a sh asterisk t cook. Finally understanding what's going on, Peter knows how to handle the situation. I promise that nothing is wrong with it this time. I followed a recipe and everything. I swear. After his promise was made, Aunt May hesitated for a moment before sighing and reluctantly cutting a piece of her chicken. She stared at the food on her fork for a good minute before trying it. As soon as she started to chew, May's face morphed from nervous horror to shocked bliss. Wow, it's actually good. May says after swallowing her first bite. Of course, it's good. I've been cooking my own meals since my parents died in my last life. Peter thought as he smiled at May's praise. Thanks, I gave it my all. After dinner, Peter watched some Korean dramas with May until she was ready for bed. Once she was in bed and he was sure she was asleep, Peter went to his room and locked the door. With a single thought, his clothes were replaced with his Spider-Man suit. Peter made sure the suit was in anti-camera mode before opening his window and jumping out. He hasn't had the chance to test his web swinging, so now's the time. Shooting a web at the nearest building, Peter grabs hold of it and swings down the street. Repeating this over and over, Peter was like Tarzan swinging through the jungle. The feeling of swinging between buildings around New York City was the most freeing and exciting thing that Peter has ever felt. 
When he would come across an obstacle, Peter would run along rooftops or the sides of building with his wall-crawling abilities. Whoa! Peter yelled excitedly as he did a backflip midair in the center of Times Square before shooting another web and swinging away. He noticed how easy it was to get around the city compared to other forms of travel. Landing on a high rooftop, Peter googles how long NYC is and found that it was 35 miles long from northeast to southwest. After some quick math, Peter found that at his speed he would be able to cover that ground in 21 minutes. That may be long in an emergency, but it's very unlikely that Peter would ever have to cover even half of that distance to get to a crime. Speaking of crime, Peter realized that he hasn't seen any since he jumped out of his window. I should have gotten a police scanner. He mutters under his breath. While waiting to hear some sirens on a random building in the center of New York City, Peter turns off his anti-camera enchantment. He only needs to use it during times where he could implicate his true identity, so pretty much whenever he heads out and returns home. After waiting a good 10 minutes, the sound of ambulance and fire truck sirens began ringing in Peter's ears as red and blue lights lit up a nearby street. It's finally go time. Peter says as he jumps off the tall skyscraper, like Ezio Auditora aiming for a nearby haystack. Swinging above the fire trucks, Peter finally saw their destination. A low-income apartment building was burning and smoke was rising from the few open windows. Screams for help could be heard as people rush out of the building, coughing up smoke all the way. Okay, you can do this. It's showtime. Peter psyches himself up to dispel the nervousness he feels. Increasing his speed, Peter overtakes the first responders as he rushes to the burning building. As he swings over the onlookers outside the building a few of them look up and see as Peter swings into one of the smoking windows. Did you see that? What was that? Did someone just swing into the window? Not, nah, you probably just inhaled too much smoke. No, I swear I saw it. The talks continued as those that saw Peter watched the window he dived in with anticipation. Inside the building, Peter could barely see due to the smoke, so he began to call out for anyone left behind in the building. Pacing the halls, Peter called out at the top of his lungs for anyone to answer him. Thankfully, the suit seemed to be smokeproof as Peter didn't seem to be affected by the fume-filled building. He didn't even feel hot in the slightest. Soon enough, someone finally called back to him. Help. My babies. Help. In here. Help. A woman's voice called out. Locking onto her location with his enhanced hearing, Peter moves at breakneck speed. Arriving in front of an apartment door, Peter saw that it was blocked by a big burning beam that fell through the ceiling. Hang on, I'm coming to get you. Peter yells as he lifted the burning beam and shoved it aside. You can open the door now. Peter calls but doesn't get an answer this time. Since he didn't get an answer, Peter broke the door down and saw a mother and her two children passed out next to an open window. The place was burning and filled with smoke like the rest of the building. Acting quickly, Peter puts the mother over his shoulder and grabs the children under each arm before jumping out of the window. He runs down the side of the building and places the family of three gently on the ground. Firemen that have just arrived were clearing the scene and hooking hoses to nearby fire hydrants. When they saw someone jump out of a window, they thought someone was committing suicide or just trying to survive the fire. Though their expectations changed drastically when they saw an oddly dressed man run down the side of the building as if he was defying gravity, and placing three unconscious people on the ground. Smoke inhalation? Get the medics on them. Peter says as he shoots a web to the open window he came from and pulls, launching himself back inside the building. Wait. Don't go back in there. A fireman yells but Peter was already gone. Back inside the building, Peter began to realize that his current strategy wasn't working fast enough. He needed to find a better way to locate these people at a much quicker pace. Trusting his enhanced senses, Peter closed his eyes and honed in on his hearing. It was the only sense he had that wasn't clouded at the moment. His eye and nose were being blocked by smoke, so he hoped his ears were enough to guide him. Soon enough, Peter started to hear things more clearly. It started with the sound of crackling fire and the creaking of the old building, but soon enough he began to hear the remaining people in the building. Their breaths, heartbeats, and small movements. Peter could hear it all. Kicking it into overdrive, Peter first rushed to those that were in more dire situations than others. Soon enough, Peter became a regular appearance for the 911 responders outside. He would find people or even pets, carry them out the nearest window, set them down, and rush back in to do it all over again. When Peter finally brought out his last group of people, paramedics took them away as a few cops walked up to him. Hey, who are you? A man dressed as a detective asks. I'm just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Peter says as he shoots a web to a nearby building, pulls on it, and swings away. A slash N, almost 1,800 words. Don't forget my stones. Or I'll. Oh God, I don't know if I should say this. No, I won't sully your ears with such vile filth. My mind is truly a dark and dirty place. Just know that if I don't get my stones, I can't be held accountable for my actions stares at you with dead eyes. Chapter 8, C8 on the radar. As of this chapter, the Patreon is four chapters ahead at chapter 12. I'll be writing two more chapters today. Get on. On a flat screen TV in a tall high rise unmarked government building, a video of a burning building was playing showing a man dressed in a red and blue spider themed superhero suit rescuing everyone inside. He swung around on the webs he would shoot from his hands and defied gravity as he easily walked on the side of the burning building. A bald African American man stood in front of the TV, studying the spider hero. He wore an eye patch and a black leather trench coat. 
Insert picture of MCU Nick Fury here. Hill, what do we know about this one? He asks over his shoulder. Standing behind him is a woman holding a very advanced looking data pad that seems to be controlling the picture on the TV. Insert picture of MCU Maria Hill here. Tapping the iPad looking device a few times, the picture changed to what looked like a news camera's perspective. The video played as the spider-styled man leaped out of a burning window and landed on the ground, safely dropping off some unconscious victims of the fire. Hey, who are you? Someone off camera yells. I'm just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. The self-proclaimed Spider-Man says as he shoots a web and disappears from the camera's view. He calls himself Spider-Man. She says as security footage from all over NYC along with cell phone videos begin to play on the TV. We've searched security footage and videos uploaded to social media. None were of any help in finding his identity or any possible home address. Is he a threat? The bald man asks as he reviews the videos. Not likely. He seemed to spend the night swinging around New York and helping anyone that needed it. From the fire we just saw, to small things like breaking up minor street fights. There are even a few videos of him bringing food to some homeless people. Have we collected any of his, web? He asks with a scoff. Yes, and it's been tested. She says and shows a picture of the collected webbing on the TV. The lab says that it's organic, but we were unable to extract any DNA from it. All right, keep looking into this. I have a meeting with the World Security Council to get to dash the one-eyed man says as he makes his way to the door. And adds Spider-Man's name to the Avengers initiative. Yes, sir. The morning after his debut as Spider-Man, Peter woke up around 8 a.m. and made his way to the living room. I'm just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. On the living room TV, Peter could see a group of newscasters reacting to his big name drop. There you have it. New York seems to have its own superpowered hero. No one knows his identity, but whoever he is, Spider-Man has our thanks. Good morning, May. Peter says as he sits on the sofa next to his aunt, who was watching TV with a mug of coffee in her hands. Morning, did you see this? May says as she points to the TV, where another video of Spider-Man saving people was being played. Nope, what is it? Peter asked and May begins explaining every good deed he did last night. While they're talking, the news plays a clip that Peter expected to see sooner or later, though he hoped it would be later. It seems that not everyone sees our new spider hero in the same light. J. Jonah Jameson has this to say. A news anchor said as they transition to a clip. Spider-Man is suspicious if you ask me. In the clip, Peter could see a bald mustached man in a blue suit yelling about his Spider-Man conspiracy theories. Behind him was a logo that read the dailybugle.net. Insert picture of MCU J. Jonah Jameson here. And how do we know that he didn't start that fire? A man was sent to the hospital. Probably some masked psychopath. Spider-Man is a menace. The clip showed a small compilation of J. Jonah's thoughts on Spider-Man. God I hate that man. May mutters as she muted the TV. Sadly, a lot of dumb people follow him. It can't be that bad right? Spider-Man seems to be helping people. They should understand. Peter says as he gets up to scour the kitchen for food. The majority of people who are sensible will understand, but the vocal minority that are fans of that bald mustache twirling clown will turn every good thing Spider-Man does into some conspiracy. May says in annoyance as she joins Peter in the kitchen. Trust me, I've seen him do it to other people before. Celebrities, politicians, it doesn't matter. Jonah will make the nicest deeds seem like horrible cover UPS. After hearing Aunt May's words, Peter thought that maybe he should combat the bad propaganda that Jonah spreads with his own. Of course, what he does won't be propaganda as he wouldn't be misleading people. The question is how can he do that? While thinking about this, Peter ate his breakfast with May and left the apartment with the excuse of visiting Ned. Arriving at the New York Sanctum, Peter portaled over to Kamar Taj and met with the Ancient One. The first thing he did upon arrival was ask for the Wi-Fi password, which he received without a problem. He needed the Wi-Fi so he could message May and Ned on WhatsApp since he has no signal here. Today, Peter was expecting to learn more magic, but sadly, the Ancient One took him to the library and left him there after stacking a bunch of books for him to read. Sigh, let's get to work. A few weeks later. During these past weeks, Peter has stuck to a steady schedule. On weekdays, he would go to school and hang out with Ned while attending classes. Thanks to his Parker brain, Peter has been easily acing all of his classes. Everything was simple and he didn't even have to study for tests. He doesn't even have to do his homework outside of school. Peter would just finish it throughout the school day. After school ended, Peter would try to hang out with Ned for a bit. Then he would either go straight to Kamar Taj or to his underground warehouse lair. At the lair, Peter would do a combination of exercises to up his already crazy strength, speed, etc. During his time in Kamar Taj, Peter would be stuck in the library memorizing different dead languages and other material for a few hours before returning home to Aunt May. Once May would head off to bed, Peter would sneak out to do his spiderly duties. Of course, he learned his lesson from the first night as Spider-Man Peter bought a Bluetooth earpiece that he upgraded and modified to seamlessly fit under the mask of his suit. With the earpiece connected to his phone, Peter could use an app to listen in on police dispatch. Now he knows exactly where to go when he was needed, which has made his nights much more hectic. Though most nights are filled with normal low-level crime, Peter has responded to a good amount of robberies and even a couple of gang-related shootings throughout the few weeks he's been active as Spider-Man. Of course, J. Jonah Jameson continued to spread his anti-Spider-Man propaganda. 
Doing so was good business for him, as speaking about Spider-Man skyrocketed his ratings and following. On the weekends, Peter would put in a lot of hours at Camartage, but other than that the schedule was the same except for school. Speaking of school, banners, posters, and flyers have been posted all around the building, promoting this year's homecoming. Homecoming itself consisted of a pep rally, a football game, and the homecoming dance itself. It was pretty much a celebration of school starting again and a way to bring the school's community together. Seeing the decorations and notices going up, Peter understood that it was finally time to stop stalling. He was going to ask MJ to go to homecoming with him. It was a nerve-wracking thing to do for the first time as rejection loomed over his shoulder, but if Peter could do his duties as Spider-Man, he could do anything. During lunch on a Friday, Peter ignored Ned, who was talking about a game he has been into lately and psyched himself up before getting up and walking towards MJ's table. She was sitting alone as always, reading a book while listening to her headphones. Huh? Where are you going, Peter? Ned asked as Peter strolled over and took a seat across from MJ. Ah, uh, hey. Peter says as he waves his hand to get her attention. Pulling out her earbuds, MJ peeks at him over her open book before putting it aside. Peter, right? What's up? She asks, not expecting anyone to talk to her. MJ had a difficult home life as she and her mother haven't heard from her father for a while. Although he just up and disappeared one day, based on the movies her father would return in a few years. Because of this MJ developed a sarcastic and guarded demeanor as she grew, preferring to read her books, and often had difficulty when trying to establish friendships. In school, MJ is the sarcastic loner that mocks her fellow students from the sidelines whenever they do or say something dumb. Not knowing how to open up to people and scaring everyone away with her tough sarcastic persona, MJ has spent the majority of her school life alone. Of course, that doesn't mean she isn't lonely. She's human and everyone wants people they can talk to and rely on. Sadly, she's just not good with people and hasn't had the chance to connect with anyone. Yeah, Peter Parker. You're Michelle, right? Peter asks in return even though he already knew. Just call me MJ, she says. Okay, MJ it is. Peter says before confidently doing what he came here to do. Do you want to go to homecoming with me, MJ? A slash N, 1720 words. Don't forget my stones, and I'll do nice things this time. Rainbows, butterflies, ponies. All of that good stuff, smiley face, staring into the smiling face, you feel something isn't right. Chapter 9, C9 Suspended. As of this chapter, the Patreon is five chapters ahead at chapter 14. I'll be writing two more chapters today. Get on. Do you want to go to homecoming with me, MJ? Peter asks confidently as all of his earlier nervousness melted away. Looking back at his earlier nervousness, Peter thought that he was an idiot. This was easy and it didn't matter if he got rejected. He's Spider-Man for crying out loud. Huh. MJ froze as she stared at Peter in shock. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I'm asking you to homecoming. Peter says plainly. Like as friends. MJ adds at the end. No, as a date. Peter clarifies. Staring at Peter in disbelief, MJ doesn't know what to say or do. She's never been in this situation before. While this is happening, two people were eavesdropping on the conversation. Ned, who was seated at a nearby table, and Flash who was walking by and slowed down to snoop on Peter. Holy sh asterisk t that's hilarious. Flash exclaims, drawing everyone's attention as he laughs openly. Puny Peter just asked the loner to homecoming. Flash finally found his shot to make fun of Peter, as his friends and a few others laughed at his words. Sadly, this moment would be short-lived, as the school's queen of comebacks was involved this time. Dispelling her earlier nervousness, MJ turned to Flash and ripped into him. Being a asterisk CK won't make yours any bigger, Flash. MJ says with sarcasm dripping from her voice. This got a laugh from some students as well, especially the girls in the room. F asterisk CK off, Watson. Flash says with a goading smirk. Don't call me that. MJ's demeanor changed instantly as she glares at Flash. MJ's full name is Michelle Jones Watson, but she hates her last name as it reminds her of her absent father. Flash knows this as he was told all about MJ's father by a girl that MJ tried to open up to during the last school year. Seeing as that girl wasn't a trustworthy person, the fallout between them only magnified MJ's already guarded demeanor. What's the matter, Watson? You can dish it but you can't take it? Maybe we should call your daddy to come pick you up? Oh, wait. I forgot dash Flash pushes all of MJ's buttons. Don't you say another word. MJ looked beyond pissed off. That's right, we wouldn't be able to find him, would we? Flash says with an evil smirk. It's been too long since he had a win like this. For a whole month, Peter has outdone him in class and easily overturned any of his schemes. Today he finally has a win, but he may have taken it a bit too far. Because by this point, the cafeteria was quietly watching. No one laughed or gossiped. It was deathly silent. Looking at MJ's frustrated face, Peter could see that she was actually close to crying. He knew from the movies that her father's absence affected her, but he didn't know it was to this extent. I'm getting suspended. Peter says low enough for only MJ to hear him. What? This distracts her from the frustration and anger she felt as she looks at Peter questioningly. I said I wouldn't do this, but I guess some things are inevitable. Peter thought as he stood from his seat and walked toward Flash. What's up, P asterisk SSY Parker? Upset for your girlfriend. Flash says condescendingly. Yeah, a little bit. P 
Peter nods as he winds back his fist and punches Flash upside the nose. Crack. The hit landed cleanly as Flash never expected Peter to hit him. Of course, Peter held back as he didn't want to one-punch man the guy. Even though he held back, that didn't mean Peter went easy on him. A sickening crack was heard as the bone in his nose broke and Flash was sent tumbling backward onto the floor. What the? Ned exclaims as he watches everything unfold in shock. The rest of the cafeteria was as shocked as Ned, as they were either watching in surprise or gossiping about what just happened. Looking down at Flash, who was laying on his side while cradling his face, Peter walked up to Ned and grabbed his backpack. Dude, that was. Ned says but ends up lost for words. Yay, text you later. Peter says and Ned nods, knowing he's most likely getting suspended. There are cameras all over the school and the lunch ladies had to have seen what happened. Before leaving the cafeteria, Peter walked up to MJ one last time. Give me your phone. Peter says and she hands it over robotically, still in shock from what just happened. Peter quickly puts his contact info in her phone and texts himself so he has her number as well. He feels his phone vibrate in his pocket, confirming that the text went through. Okay, I'll text you later. Peter says as he hands her back the phone and walks out of the cafeteria. Going straight to the school's main office, Peter takes a seat outside and starts reading a book on Python, which is a high-level coding language. Peter has been buying books like this recently and was amazed by how easy it was for him to understand everything. It was like he had a fog blocking his mind in his last life and now it's cleared completely. Peter was a straight-A student in his last life too, which just goes to show how amazing his new Parker brain is. While he was waiting for the principal to find out what happened, lone footsteps could be heard coming down the hall from the cafeteria. Looking up, Peter could see MJ walking toward him. What are you doing here? Peter asks as he closes his book. I kicked Flash in the ribs after you left. MJ says as she takes a seat next to him and pulls out a book of her own. I see. Peter says with a smile and he and MJ start reading their respective books in silence. Both of them were a bit socially awkward and didn't know what to say, especially after what just happened. Though after a few minutes of silence, MJ was the first to speak up. Yes. She says without any other context. Yes, what? Peter asks confusedly. Homecoming. I'll go with you. MJ clarifies. Good, I just hope we're allowed to go after this. Peter says as he knows they're either getting a lot of detention or a few days of suspension. MJ nodded before the silence returned and they started reading again. After waiting for a bit, the principal came out of the main office and called both Peter and MJ inside. Knowing that his Aunt May will most likely get called in for this, Peter sent her a short text explaining what happened. After answering the principal's questions and explaining what happened, both of their guardians were called as Peter expected. Apparently, Flash had to go to the hospital because of a broken nose and the possibility of broken ribs. When Peter heard this he looked over at MJ, she noticed his gaze and merely shrugged, as she didn't think she kicked him that hard. Both of them didn't really care though, Flash deserved it for taking his bullying too far, and it's not like he hasn't had this coming for a while now. When his Aunt May showed up in her hospital clothes, Peter felt bad for taking her away from work, though the woman herself didn't care one bit. Kids love getting out of school and adults loved getting out of work, especially when she got that text from Peter. May knew that Flash has been bullying Peter for a while now, but sadly, the school would do nothing about it. So when she got a text from Peter saying he punched the little bee asterisk starred, she didn't mind one bit. Though when she read further and saw that he did it for the girl he likes, May nodded with a smile on her face. Leave it to Peter to punch his longtime bully for a girl and not because he's been bullied for four years. She thought. Is that her? May asks as she walks to the main office and sees Peter and MJ sitting outside. MJ heard what she asked and looked at Peter with a raised eyebrow. Yes, now stop whatever this is. Peter says as he knows what she's doing. Hello, I'm Peter's Aunt May. May introduces herself to MJ as she ignores Peter completely. Please tell me Peter asked you out. Yeah, he did. MJ answers as she looks between Peter and his aunt questioningly. Is this revenge for not telling you who the girl was? Peter says and May turns to him with a smirk. Of course not. I'm not that petty, she said but Peter didn't believe her for a second. Apparently you are. Peter says under his breath but they both could hear him. MJ found the whole situation to be funny as she has a similar relationship with her mom. They became close like this after her father left. Soon enough, MJ's mother arrived as well and another meeting was held to explain what happened. MJ's mother gave Peter a small nod of approval when she learned of everything that transpired. Once everything was said and done, Peter and MJ were suspended from school for two days starting on Monday, which means they get a four-day weekend. Of course, Peter and MJ didn't mind one bit. Thankfully, they weren't barred from attending homecoming, which they were happy about. As the group of four were leaving the school together, Aunt May turned to MJ's mother. I wish I could punch one of my co-workers and get a couple days off. May says, causing MJ's mother to chuckle uncontrollably. Same. A slash N, 1644 words smiling face with smiling eyes enjoy. Don't forget my stones. Or I'll end hashtag percent dollar your at end percent. You think you can just withhold your stones from me you yen dollar, at, percent hashtag euro. Chapter 10, see 10 canon on the horizon. As of this chapter, the Patreon is 6 chapters ahead at chapter 16. I'll be writing 2 more chapters today. Get on. In the blazing desert of Afghanistan, a convoy of U.S. military hummers moved leisurely like a snake through the sand. 
Some Humvees were fitted with miniguns, which were manned by soldiers who stood through a sort of sunroof of the vehicle. Inside a gunless Humvee in the center of the pack was a group of soldiers, but one person stood out among the rest. He wore an expensive black designer suit and sunglasses that looked to be Ray-Bans. Insert picture of MCU Tony Stark here. I feel like you're driving me to a court-martial. This is crazy. What did I do? I feel like you're going to pull over and snuff me. What? You're not allowed to talk. Hey, Forrest. Tony tries his best to make conversation in the awkward silence of the Hummer. We can talk, sir. The soldier in the passenger seat answers. Oh, I see. So it's personal. Tony asks. No, you intimidate them. The female soldier who's driving the Humvee says. Good God, you're a woman. I honestly, I couldn't have called that. I mean, I'd apologize, but isn't that what we're going for here? I thought of you as a soldier first. Tony puts his foot in his mouth and tries to clarify jokingly. I'm an airman. She corrects him. Or airwoman. Tony says as she shoots him a look over her shoulder for a brief moment. You have excellent bone structure, there. I'm kind of having a hard time not looking at you now, is that weird? Hearing Tony work his magic, the soldiers in the vehicle chuckle, and the mood instantly changes from the earlier awkward atmosphere. After answering some questions and talking about his sexual escapades with some models, a soldier nervously spoke to Tony. Is it cool if I take a picture with you? He asks. Yes. It's very cool. Tony agrees easily as he's used to this. The soldier next to him pulls his camera out and hands it to the soldier in the front seat. I don't want to see this on your MySpace page. Tony jokes as the soldier puts up a peace sign for the photo. Please, no gang signs. The soldier puts his hand down nervously. No, throw it up. I'm kidding. Yeah, peace. I love peace. I'd be out of a job with peace. As the picture was about to be taken, something hit and blew up the vehicle in front of them. Boom. Gunshots and such were heard and hit the side of their vehicle. Tony begins to panic and asks questions as the soldiers get out of the car with their M4s drawn. The soldier that was taking a picture with Tony stayed with him and drew his weapon, looking outside the windows. Gunfire and explosions filled the area as the American soldiers fought a losing battle. The enemy had numbers, weaponry, and the surprise advantage. It was the perfect ambush. Son of AB asterisk TCH. The remaining soldier curses as he goes out to help his dying comrades. Wait, 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 wait. Give me a gun. Tony pleads. Stay here. The soldier orders as he turned back around and was gunned down, bullet holes piercing the vehicle. Tony's hearing and senses were dulled a bit as he got himself out of the vehicle, stumbling a bit in the chaos. He got some of his hearing back and ran, diving behind some rocks for cover. He pulled out his phone to call for help when a bomb landed next to him. He looked over to see it have Stark Industries printed on it. He tried to get up and get away but didn't make it in time. Boom. The bomb exploded and made him fly through the air. Tony hit the ground hard, dulling his senses again as his ears rang. He felt a pain in his chest and pulled his shirt off as blood started to pool onto the desert floor. Tony Stark is missing and thought to be either dead or kidnapped. On his recent trip to Afghanistan, the genius playboy hosted a demonstration of the new Stark Industries Jericho missile which was designed for the United States Air Force. During Peter's four-day weekend, news dropped that Tony Stark was missing. Stark Industries stock dipped sharply as shareholders sold in a panic. Peter knew all of this would happen, but sadly he's too poor to take advantage of his knowledge. He had pocket money from his pickpocketing, but it wasn't enough to buy large amounts of Stark stock. At most he would just buy now and sell when it's high again, but he wouldn't make much. Also, if Peter deposited his illegally gained money, which he didn't pay taxes for, into a bank and used it to buy stock, that's just asking for the IRS to show up. Though Peter has a few ideas on how to make money, his legal ideas will take some time. If he wants to stop stealing and use his intellect to make money by starting a company, for example, Peter would have to come up with a product, figure out production and distribution, hire employees, market it, and a lot more. Not to mention the money it takes to do all of that. Truthfully, all of that sounds like a giant hassle to Peter. He would rather use one of the much easier and less time-consuming ways to fill his bank account. Though that doesn't mean he won't hone his intellect and skills to create new technologies. Whether they be used for his life as Peter or Spider-Man, his creations won't be released to the general public. Maybe he would sell some harmless tech to Stark Industries, but that would have to wait until Tony is back. He doesn't trust Stena one bit. How long was Tony kidnapped again? Peter thought as he tried remembering the first Iron Man movie. I think it was a few months. While Peter was thinking deeply about the future and his plans, May watched his reaction to the news. May knew that Peter, in a small way, idolized Tony Stark, even though she didn't like the man very much. She thought the news may be hard on him. Seeing his contemplative look, May mistook it for concern and felt bad for Peter. Don't worry, Peter. May says as she puts a comforting hand on his shoulder. If he's alive the military will bring him back. He's too important not to. Dash one week later. Seeing the Stark stock fall, Peter thought it was finally time to start his money-making plan. After reading multiple books on coding, game design, and other tech-related subjects, Peter started his work on making the best mobile pay-to-win game he could. Checking the mobile game market, Peter found that a lot of the games from his old life either don't exist or haven't been made yet. Knowing what was good from his past life, Peter started designing a game he knew would be popular. Candy Crush. 
The game had a large fan base of over 250 million and generated $1.19 billion in 2020. Luckily, the game just so happened to not exist in this world. What's good about mobile games, is that Peter doesn't have to worry about selling copies of his games in physical stores. He only had to make it and get it approved to go up on the different mobile phone market apps. Let's not forget the many microtransactions, which will rake in the money. Before starting, Peter bought a better computer with his stolen money. He would need a good PC that runs fast so that the development moves quickly and all his work is done super efficiently. He was still a beginner at game development and soon found that he needed to know more than he initially thought. First, he wasn't the greatest artist and found that he needed to make all of the visuals himself. He had to download a 3D modeling program and bought a clunky art tablet. Second, Peter had to make his own sound effects and music. He had to buy an electric keyboard and download an audio production program to make the music. As for the sound effects, some were taken from open source websites he found, while others were recorded by Peter himself and edited to perfection. Thankfully, Peter didn't need any voiceovers for the game. Otherwise, he would have had to hire some people to record lines for him. Other than that, the rest of the game design was fairly simple for Peter. The only times he had trouble was when he needed to do the art or sound, but he soon became adept in those areas as well. Only a week passed since Peter began creating his first game, and based on his calculations, it would take another month at least to get it ready for testing. It could be finished sooner if Peter didn't have such a packed schedule. While working on his game, Peter's phone vibrated and lit up with a new text popping up. MJ hey, what you doing? Taking his phone. Peter unlocks it and types back. Peter on my PC. What's up? He decided to keep the game a secret from everyone except Ned, who would never forgive him if he wasn't involved. Ned came over to hang out, give ideas, and help with small things whenever he could. His best friend was far more excited about the game than Peter was. He wanted to surprise everyone else with a finished game. He would invite everyone over and have them play his game when it passed the testing phase. MJ are you getting a tuxedo for homecoming? Peter I haven't decided yet. What are you wearing? MJ? Seeing her reply, Peter confusedly reread his last text and immediately understood. Peter not like that. Peter what are you wearing to homecoming? MJ I knew that already smiling face with horns. MJ I don't know either neutral face. Peter want to go shopping together tomorrow? We only have a week left. She didn't respond for a minute, but Peter saw that she read his message. MJ sure. A slash n, 1700 words. Don't forget my stones. Or I won't upload a chapter tomorrow ha 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 ha. That's right, I have the power here.